We're glad to have all of our boys and girls with us here this morning, and I want them to help me out, okay? I'm going to read. We're talking about the birth of God's son, and we're talking about the greatest gift that's ever been given. And when the angel showed up in Luke chapter 2 to the shepherds that were out in the field, I'm going to say the first verse, and then when I get to the next verse, I want you all, if you know this verse, okay, all you kids, I want you to help me out and say it, okay? So when the shepherd showed up to the angels in the field, he said, and the angel said unto them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people, everybody, all you boys and girls, if you know this, help me out. For unto you born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Man, when we're talking about Jesus being born, we're talking about a Savior being born. And we are talking about a gift that God gave us that truly changes everything. Now, have you ever gotten a Christmas gift that changed everything? Have you ever gotten one? I brought, I brought one gift with me here this morning that has had a big impact on my life. Oh, goodness gracious, i got to get this out. thing out right here. You guys see this gift right here? This is, I was trying to rack my mind of gifts that have had a profound impact and have really changed my life. And a couple years ago, I think it was like two years ago, it was Black Friday, and Alana and I gifted ourselves a Dyson cordless vacuum cleaner. Now, you may be wondering, why am I holding this vacuum cleaner? I gotta, I gotta tell you, I like to vacuum. There's a few things I like to do. I like to mow my lawn. I like to blow the leaves off of my driveway and out of my yard, and I like to vacuum. And you might be wondering, why do I like to do all those things? All of those things make a lot of noise. And they drown out all of the other crazy noise that's happening in my house. So I can just kind of drown it out and I can think. And also, each one of those things provides you with instant gratification. I mean, you see immediate results. The leaves are gone. The grass is mowed. The dirt is off the floor. And wow, that is just such a fulfilling thing. And this little guy right here, no more cords. Man, you can just walk all over the house, live in your best vacuuming life ever. It's amazing. I love it. I highly recommend this. And Dyson has not sponsored this ad. Another gift I was thinking about, actually, I got on Christmas, and I, I tried to find it last night, but it was my very first smartphone that I ever got back before. There was, like, the, the Androids and the Apples, and, I mean, they were just coming out. So the very first smartphone, and it happened, actually, at Christmas. And uh, we had gone up to New Jersey, and we all made it safely to my mom and dad's house, and then a big, massive snowstorm came in. I think it was like a record-setting snowstorm. I think we got 18 inches of snow in like 24 hours, and it was awesome. I mean, it really was. It was beautiful, and it was great, and man, the snow was there, and we were all excited until about 36 hours later when we'd all been cooped up in the same house together. And so we started counting up and doing the math, and there was like seven adult men, I mean, between my dad and the brothers and brother-in-laws, and we're like, we're going into business. My dad had enough shovels. We went and we're like, I want a new smartphone. I want to make some money. So we got out, and we just started knocking on their neighbor's doors, asking if they wanted us to shovel the driveway, and we did. We did like three or four hours. We all made about 150 bucks each. I thought that was a pretty good, smart use of time right there, you know? So then the next day, I went to Verizon, and I bought a smartphone. And I'll tell you what, those things really have changed everything. I, I don't know if I could imagine... Going backwards, I mean, I was thinking of all the trips that I used to take between Pennsylvania and New Jersey. We had no phones whatsoever. If you broke down, we went through the drill. Call, collect, or here's a calling card. Anybody remember that? Like pay phones and stuff like that. If you get separated, just keep on going. I mean, we had to go through all these things. Now you can be in touch with people 24-7. Man, you get emergency weather alerts, so you never have to wonder if danger is right around the corner. I mean, there's all kinds of benefits. One of my favorites is FaceTime, especially when my wife sends me to the grocery store to shop. Even though she lays it out aisle by aisle, I still can't find it, and I get frustrated. And I call her about eight times while I'm in there. And so I don't know why she sends me. She might as well just shop because I'm taking up her time anyway. But I'll tell you what, those things really, truly do change everything. They've made life unbelievably convenient. Now, you might be wondering again, like, what are we talking about here? I'm talking about things that have had a profound impact maybe in our personal lives and in our world. And think about the best Christmas present that you ever had, a gift that really has had a profound impact on your life. Can I tell you that every single one of them absolutely pales in comparison to what this truly is all about? 
and to the greatest gift that was ever given to us in the birth of God's son, Jesus. A savior was born. And the best part of Christmas is the fact that we get to experience Christ and the relationship that we can have with him and all of the amazing gifts that come as a result of it. Man, we just got done playing that video, and I love the verse that they showed from Isaiah. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I guarantee you there's enough there to meditate on for the next entire week, thinking about the profound impact that each one of those things could make in your life. I love the fact that we just got done singing, I just want to speak the name of Jesus. What is his name? His name is power. His name is healing. His name is life. He is the Savior. He is the King. He truly does and can change everything about our lives. And I'm so glad that we've been able to spend this month and our Christmas series in Romans chapter 8. Because Romans 8 is just packed full of amazing gifts, securities, assurances, all of the different benefits. When we talk about gifts that keep on giving, Jesus is a gift that keeps on giving in every area of our life. And I've enjoyed unpacking that. And this morning is going to be no different because we have some absolutely incredible truths. Just two that we're going to look at this morning. Don't get excited that it's going to be any shorter than normal, okay? But two gifts that we're going to look at this morning. I want to start with this. Number one, I am adopted. I am adopted. Look at verse 14 of our passage here in Romans chapter 8. It says this. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Here's a question for you this morning. Are you led by the Spirit of God? There's an implied reality here. All throughout Romans chapter 8, there have been implied realities. And here's the implied reality. Not everybody is led by the Spirit of God. Just like not everybody has the Spirit of God in them. Just like the fact that not everybody is in Christ. We keep coming to these implied realities. And so the question is, are you led by the Spirit? Do you remember the day where you put your faith and trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? I'm not talking about just having a head knowledge. I'm not talking about being here on a Sunday morning during Christmas season where you expect to hear about Jesus being born. I'm talking about do you know him personally as your Lord and Savior? Do you remember the time in your life where you recognized that your sin had a payment and that sin and that payment was death, eternal separation from God forever in hell? And there's nothing that you can do to save yourself, but that's where the cross of Jesus comes into play because on the cross he died and he took your place. And all you have to do to be saved is to believe on the Lord Jesus, to give your life to him, to recognize that he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. Do you remember that day? Do you remember what happened as a result? Do you remember the peace that flooded your soul? Hey, the Holy Spirit of God came to live inside of you, and he convinces you that you are a child of God and that you are a believer. So if you're led by the Spirit, if you're in Christ, if you have that relationship with him, you know what that verse just said? You are the sons, you are part of the sons of God. You are a son or a daughter of God, a child of the king. Look at verse 15. He goes on, he says, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit that we have in God and in the spirit of adoption is completely different than the spirit of fear and bondage that we had under the law. Under the law, we were condemned. You know what is a huge, massive part of the Christmas story? Fear. You can't read through the Christmas story without coming across that word fear. Every time an angel shows up, the people feared. Mary feared when the angel showed up to tell her that she was going to give birth to Jesus. The, the shepherds that were out in the fields watching over their sheep, they were terrified. They were trembling when an angel showed up. Have any of you ever had an angel show up in your life in your sleep or in person? Okay, if an, if an angel that came from the very presence of God showed up in our lives, I guarantee you, that would shock us. That would rock our world. There would be fear as a result. And we're only talking about angelic beings that just left the presence of God. We're not even talking about God himself. 
as holy as, as unjust sinners, we are broken people. If we were to stand in the presence of a holy and righteous and just God in our sinfulness, we would have to fear because we are condemned. We've already seen that in the book of Romans. Our sin condemns us and sin cannot be in the presence of a holy, righteous God. So it's right. It's absolutely right. There should be a spirit of bondage and a spirit of fear because there's no escaping the truth and the reality of the law that we are dead and that we deserve a punishment and that there's absolutely nothing that we can do about it. But the good news of Christmas is that he delivered the message, fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Jesus came to die to set us free from that spirit of fear and bondage. And to replace it with the spirit of adoption. Now, this is a pretty life-changing and dramatic truth. So here's first practical application. Celebrate your standing. Celebrate your standing. I've asked my nephew, Will, where's Will at? Will, come on down here and help Uncle Mike out. Give Will a big round of applause as he comes down here to help me out. Come on up here, Will. All right, I got a little present for you in here. Will's going to open up our first gift today. Go ahead. Uh Uh-oh. What is in there? Go ahead. Take it out. Oh, man, we got a pack of M&Ms. Those are for you to keep. We got a party hat right here. Wait, uh, don't go nowhere yet. Get back here. I got to put this on, man. Check this out. We're putting this party hat on Will. Hey, I want to tell you something about Will. Almost a year ago to date, Will became an official member of the Brown family. Last year, right before Christmas, we had the opportunity to go to the courthouse. And, uh, man, I love the way that all of that goes and, and works out. There's a... There's a caseworker typically that's there when you're in the courthouse and they, uh, the judge says, well, what do you recommend? And the caseworker says something like, we recommend that Will be placed permanently in the Brown family and that he's adopted. And then the judge looks at Dave and Patty and they're like, is this what your wishes and your desires are? And they say, yes. And typically the tears start flowing at that point in time. And then the judge, I think, said, well, why do you want to adopt him? And Patty, through tears, was just like, well, he's been my family ever since the first day he stepped into our house. He's, he's one of my children. He's no different than any of the other children. And we want it to stay that way permanently. And then the judge makes an official declaration. And he says, I hereby pronounce or decree that from this day forward, he will forever be known as Williams David Brown. And man, the emotion and the cheers. Give that a round of applause right there. It's amazing. And you know what? I know every year when that adoption date comes around, not only do you get a birthday, you get an adoption date. This man gets to party and celebrate. Because forever he'll be able to call Dave and Patty mom and dad. Something changed permanently as a result of that adoption. Give Will one more big round of applause. You go ahead and go back to your seat. Thank you, my man. You did fantastic. You want to stay up here and help me preach? No, go back to your seat. He will. (laughs) Go get your mom and dad. And sit up really good. They'll give you a peanut M&M each minute that goes by that you sit still. (laughs) I want you to understand, I use that as a real poignant example. And by the way, there are many in here that have been adopted. And adoption is wonderful. It's something that we learn from God, our Father. With the spirit of adoption, do you know how that verse ends? It says, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. This is huge. The word for Abba is actually the Hebrew word. It's just a transliteration. That's exactly how you say father in Hebrew. And then it says right after that father, which is actually the Greek word, and the Greek word for father is petar, petar, pater, sorry, pater. That's the Greek word for, um, for father. So basically what you have here in this verse is you have through the... Um, inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You have Paul that's sitting here and writing, and he says, you've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry Abba in Hebrew, and we cry Father in Greek, and these are the very 
everyday, intimate, familiar words that a child would go to his dad and his mom and he would refer to them as. And Paul's saying, that's the spirit. That spirit of fear has been removed and it's been replaced with this spirit of sonship. You can go to God and you can cry, Abba. You can cry, Father. You can cry, Dad. That's who he is. Now, this is, this is life-changing in multiple ways. Not, not, number one, he included both the Jews and the Greeks, which shows that the gospel is for everyone. So that would have rocked a lot of the, the uh, Jewish people's world in and of itself. But not only that, to be able to approach God in this type of intimate, personal way would have been something that totally shocked them. In the Old Testament, every time you come across capital L O. R and D. It is the proper name of God. And by the way, you will come across that as you read through the Old Testament thousands of times. It's the proper name of God. It means I am the self-existent one. He has always been and he will always be. It's the proper name of God. Well, the Jewish people took the command to not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain so seriously that they would not even pronounce the proper name of God. So much so that we don't even know how to pronounce it. It's called the Tetragrammaton. It's just four consonants. And there's a lot of debate. Do you pronounce it as Yahweh or do you pronounce it as Jehovah? When you hear those two words, they're both referring to the same word, which is capital L-O-R-D, Lord, in the Old Testament, the proper name of God. And because they wouldn't even speak the name of God out of fear of taking his name in vain, we don't even know how to correctly pronounce it today. Now, could you imagine Paul sitting here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? Paul was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was a Pharisee. As touching of the law, man, he was perfect, as perfect as a human being could get. And here God's telling him, hey, you can approach me and you can call me Father. That's the kind of personal, intimate relationship that you've been given in God. I'll tell you what, we are his children and we can approach the creator of the universe, the king of kings and the Lord of lords in a personal, intimate way because he loves you and he cares about you. And that's what Christmas is all about. Celebrate your standing, but it gets even better than that. Live like an heir. That's the second practical application. Live like an heir. Look at verses 16 and 17. It says, the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Oh, this is so good. If you have the spirit of God living inside of you, you know what he's going to do? He's going to convince you that you are a child of God and that you are a son of God. And as you run to your father and as you call him father, which is, by the way, how Jesus taught us to pray. You begin your prayers and you say, our father which are in heaven. Man, that puts everything in perspective right there. Our Father who's in heaven, man, he's glorious, he's holy, he's just, he's magnificent in all of his ways, but yet he is our Father. And when we run to God like that, the Spirit of God will convince us that not only are we the sons of God, but we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Okay, I've asked someone else to come help help me open up. Jaden, come on up here. This is Jaden. Give Jaden a warm round of applause, keeping the kids involved today. All right, Jaden, I need you to open up this gift right here. Here, go on the sides. There's a lot of tape on here. Oh my goodness. Julia, where's Julia? She wrapped these things with a lot of tape. All right, get that open. Are y'all are y'all excited to see what this gift is going to be? Here we go. Pop open that box. What do we have in here? Jaden, what is this? It's a crown. Let's put it on Jaden. Jaden is wearing a crown. Man, that crown looks lovely. (laughs) The reason why I had Jaden come up here is just the last time we had a baptism Sunday. Guess what? Jaden followed the Lord in baptism. Because when he was eight or nine years old, somewhere around there, it was a summer, and he was at VBS, and he trusted in Jesus Christ as his Savior. Jaden is in Christ Jaden, you have the spirit of God and of Christ living inside of you. You are led by the spirit, which you know what that makes you. It makes you a son of God, and it makes you an heir, a joint heir with Christ. This crown is a representation that we have a prince, a child of God, with all of the royalty that's bestowed on a child of God. That is who you are in Jesus Christ. That is who you and I are in Jesus Christ. Will you praise the Lord and thank Jaden at the same time as you head back to your seat? 
You have to wear that crown the whole rest of the service, okay? You don't have to. If it gets itchy, you can take it off. That's fine. I want to go back to the word adoption for a minute. The word adoption in the New Testament, it means this, being placed as an adult son. Okay, you might be saying, I thought we moved past adoption. Well, you got to understand what we're talking about here. Being placed as an adopted son, as, as an adult son. An adopted son was deliberately chosen by the adoptive father to carry on his name and his estate. And once that adoption was finalized, he became an official child of that adopted father with all the privileges that come as a son. Now, do I need to help you with where we're about to go with this? The moment you believed in Jesus Christ and you repented of your sin and you called on his name to be your Lord and Savior, you were officially adopted and placed into his family as an adult son, which means all of the privileges and all of the benefits that come along with the family name are associated with you. That means that our Father, who is the King of kings and Lord of lords and the creator of all the world, is our Heavenly Father. And He is our, we are heirs with Him and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Man, you want, you want to know how this should affect us in our lives? Man, when we celebrate our standing and when we live like an heir, you know what we live with? We don't live in fear. We don't live in fear. Our Father has promised, and we're going to look at this next Sunday, that he will work all things together for our good. Your father has all the power of the universe. He can just speak the word, and whatever mountain, whatever obstacle, whatever barrier lays in your path, it's gone and removed instantly. You can speak the name of Jesus over your family. You can speak the name of Jesus into your trials, and I promise you this, he will be there, and he will be present, and he will help, and he will strengthen. He will give peace. He will give joy. The situation might not always turn around the way that we want it to, but that does not change the fact that if we are calling on our God and on our Father, he will work and he will take care of things exactly the way that he wants, us, wants to in our hearts and in our lives. So here's just a real simple question before we move on. What is it that you're fearful of? What is it that's been holding you back this Christmas season? What barrier is in the way? Celebrate your standing. Live like an heir. Your father has it all under control. He doesn't want us to worry and fear. He wants us to trust and live with confidence and hope. What is it that you fear? Lay it at the altar today and give it to your heavenly father and live like an heir, like a child of God. That was just point number one. That was amazing. This has been such a blessing to me all week. Secondly, we're going to look at this. The best part of Christmas, the gifts that he gives us. A glorious hope. I'm adopted, but I have a glorious hope. Look at verse 17. I need you all to help me out when I get to the end here. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And all God's people said. Everybody read the next line with me. If so be that we suffer with him. I'll tell you what, I was really liking this message until I got to that phrase right there. All of those things are absolutely true about who God is and about who we are in Christ. But he adds a huge disclaimer in there. If so be that we suffer with him. We're going to look about this in just a minute. Suffering is the path to glory. Suffering is going to be a part of life. Jesus came and he suffered and he died. And if we want to be like him and be transformed into a part of being alive in a sinful, broken world is suffering. But don't worry because look how he ends that verse. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. And then verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I love how Paul put it in 2 Corinthians. You know what he said about the sufferings of this life? He said that they are light compared to the heavy weight of glory. Think about the worst possible thing that you could ever experience in this life and in this world. Can I tell you that compared to the eternal weight of glory, that your suffering is just a light affliction? It's nothing compared to what God has in store for us. Can I tell you, he also said that our suffering is, it's momentary. 
It might not feel momentary when you're going through the agony of of cancer. You're going through the agony of losing a loved one. It may not feel temporary. It may feel like it's never going to end and it's going to last forever. But compared to eternity, our life is a vapor. It appears for a time and vanishes away. And our momentary affliction, that's exactly what it is. It will pass and it will be replaced with an eternal weight of glory that we don't even know how to fully process and comprehend. Can I tell you this morning that we have a glorious hope in Jesus Christ? But that means that suffering is a painful reality. Look at how this passage builds. Look at verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. The creature, and what he's actually talking about there is the creation. The creation was made subject to vanity. That word vanity, it means purposelessness, emptiness, meaninglessness, futility. It's the same conclusion that Solomon came to when he tried all the things that life had to offer in the book of Ecclesiastes. He gave that very famous line, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Hey, trying to find meaning in all of the hurricanes and tornadoes and droughts and fires and natural disasters that happen and take place in this world, trying to find the meaning in all of that, it's empty. It's futile. The reality is this. Since the day that Adam sinned, creation has been groaning and dying just as much as you and I have been groaning and dying. And you know what? All of the misery of the world is a declaration about the horror of sin. Every time you hear about a crazy natural disaster that's coming, or every time you hear about how creation is falling apart and how it's decaying and how it's eroding, man, every time you see the calamities of life, that's not something that we should get angry at God about. That's something that we should recognize as our own fault because of our sinfulness and because of our brokenness and because we rejected the goodness of God and we didn't trust that what he had for us was better than what we had for ourselves. And as a result, the world and sin has been broken and it's been decaying and it's been falling apart and nature itself is crying out in misery. But that doesn't change the fact that glory is a realistic hope. I love how that verse started. Creation has an earnest expectation. You know what that word means? That earnest expectation has the idea of standing up on your tiptoes, kind of looking out like you're, you're looking for something. You're longing. You're going around like this, and you're like, I just, I want to see it. You know what creation's earnest expectation is? You know what they're on their, what creation, what all of nature is on its tiptoes looking out for? The manifestation of the glory of the sons of God. <laughs> They're waiting for you and I to receive the full benefits of our glory and the full benefits of everything that God has in store for us. They're waiting for the day that the Lord is going to return and he's going to make every wrong right. Because when we receive our full glory and the full benefits of the sonship of being a child of God, then guess what? Creation will as well. You know, heaven is just a temporary home. When we die before the Lord returns, we go to heaven. That's just temporary. You know where we're going to live for all of eternity? In a new heaven and a new earth. And when God comes back to rescue his own, he's also going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And creation is going to be redeemed just as much as you and I are going to be redeemed. The message and lesson that Paul's teaching us here is that suffering is the path to glory. Look at verse 22. It says, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together unto now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. The suffering of this life is real. It's Christmas time, right? But that doesn't mean that things don't break and fall apart at Christmas time. Man, there's people that lose their jobs at Christmas. There's people whose marriages are falling apart this Christmas. There are people who are fighting cancer in our church this Christmas. There are people that are getting ready to celebrate the holidays and spend time, and there's a huge hole because a mom or a dad or a son or a child that was here and healthy last year is no longer here and healthy this year. 
Sometimes Christmas can remind us about how broken life is and how difficult life is when we want everything to be perfect and everything to go just right. But yet there's those reminders constantly that that's not the world that we live in. I think about all our boys and girls in here. We got a lot of boys and girls in here. How many of you have kids that get scared sometimes? And they understand the fears of life. We're talking about creation groaning. I mean, I know whenever there's a thunderstorm, we have a visitor that still shows up in our room at night. <laughs> I won't say anybody's names. It's Saban. No, just kidding. It's none of our boys. <laughs> Sorry, Saban. That was a joke. It's not Saban. I want you to know that. <laughs> no, but you understand there's fears. Our kids, sometimes they're, 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 very, they're very smart and they're very per perceptive about life. And you know what? We can't fully alleviate all their fears. I can't promise my, my children that nothing bad will ever happen to mom and dad. I can't promise them that our house will never not burn down. I mean, those are things that happen and take place in life. But what we can point them to is the reality is what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. We have a God that is sovereign over all of those things. He's bigger and he's more powerful than every single one of those things. When he talks about the groaning and travail that we are all experiencing, he's talking about childbirth. Can I tell you, there's something different about the suffering of childbirth than the suffering of like a terminal illness like cancer. When you go through a terminal illness like cancer, what's waiting at the other end of it? Death. But when you go through the suffering and pain of childbirth, what's waiting on the other end of it? The glory of that baby's first cry. The glory of the mom taking that baby into her arms. And instantly that pain and that suffering is forgotten. And you know what? That's the truth that he's teaching us here. He's teaching us that we're groaning and we're travailing because we live in a sin-cursed and broken world. But that suffering will one day turn into glory. We don't, we don't go through life weeping and rejoicing as those who have no hope. We have every hope in our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's the true meaning of Christmas. So here's the practical application. Hold on to hope. Hold on to hope. The painful realism in this text is meant to help you hold on to your hope. Look at the very next verse. Look at verse 24. Everybody read that first line out loud with me. Are you all ready? What's it say? For we are saved by hope. We are saved by hope. We are saved by hope. It doesn't, mattering, it doesn't matter where your suffering is found. It doesn't matter if it's triggered by man, if it's triggered by Satan, if it's triggered by nature. There's all kinds of things that are working against us that create suffering in our life. The issue is this, whether you trust God's sovereign goodness over it all. Is God good in allowing everything that he's allowing to happen and take place in life? And the answer is absolutely yes. The fact that we have a savior that loved us enough to redeem us from what we deserve points to a God that is far greater and far better than anything that we could ever possibly deserve. God is sovereign over it all. God is sovereign through it all. And do you trust in the goodness of God? I've got Scarlett to come up here and help me open the last gift that we have. How many of you have kids that get really, really excited about Christmas Day and they start begging to open presents a little bit early? Go ahead, start opening that. Anybody like that? How many of you kids do that? You beg your mom and dad, let me open my presents early, please. Well, in our house, we started a tradition years ago. There's one present that they get to open early on Christmas Eve. Everybody give Julia a big round of applause. Julia, stand up. <laughs> Julia taped these things. We were giving her a hard time about that the other day. <laughs> Let me help you with this. All right, let's rip this thing open. Okay. And what do we have in here? What is the gift? Here, just take the top off. Take this out, show them to everybody. Anybody want to take a guess at what that is? It's Scarlett's Christmas pajamas. No, just kidding. Those are not hers. <laughs> Those are my Christmas pajamas. From a Christmas a long time ago. You know what we do the night before Christmas, the Christmas Eve, they open up their, their pajamas, we take a picture, and then we send them to bed. And you know what? Give Scarlett a round of applause. You can go back to your seat. <laughs> and we send our kids to bed with an earnest expectation. 
Remember being a child and remember the glory of Christmas morning? Remember how you could not sleep at night? You tossed and turned. I mean, one, one night, one Christmas a couple years ago, we woke up, it was like 3 a.m. and all the boys are awake and they're going through their stockings that had come in their room after they went to sleep and they're opening up their basketball cards and whatever and they're laughing and they're talking. I'm like, it's three o'clock in the morning. You got, uh, we got a big day coming up tomorrow, but you remember those days and how many of you kids are like that still to this day? Man, there's an earnest expectation that's there. There's a longing and a waiting because they know what the glory of Christmas morning is going to bring. Can I tell you, can I tell you that that's how God, we are saved by hope. God wants us to hold on to our hope, the glory, the weight of glory. It's eternal and it's magnificent and it's wonderful. And as we're suffering and going through the pain of this life, God never wants us to lose a hold of that hope and that glory that's one day going to come in him. Yeah, right now we might be, it might be night and we might not be able to sleep because of all of the concerns and the problems and the things that are weighing us down. But there is an eternal weight of glory and we're so long for it. That's what saves us. That's what delivers us. And we can bank on it because the Son of God went to a cross to die to deliver us every good thing that God has in store for his children. Look at the good news of this. Verse 24, for we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Think about the best day that you've ever had in your entire life. Think about the best Christmas memory that you could ever think about. I mean, it was just everything just fell into place. Everything went perfect. You went to bed that night. You're almost pinching yourself because everything just went so good and wonderful. And you just get amazed. Anybody ever had days like that? We, we all have at some point. All of those things are just as light and weightless as the eternal weight of glory. The best day that you've ever had in this life pales in comparison. You're not waiting for something that you see or else we wouldn't have anything to hope for. It's already here. We're waiting for something that we haven't seen, something far greater, something far better than that this broken world could ever deliver us. Look at what he says in verse 25. But if we hope for that we see not... Then do we with patience wait for it. If we're hoping in something greater and bigger than anything that we've ever experienced in this lifetime, and we know it's a reality because of who God is and he keeps his promises and you can always bank on his word, then guess what? We can patiently wait. And while we're patiently waiting for the redemption of our bodies, while we're patiently waiting for that day that we see Christ face to face, where our hope becomes reality, where our faith becomes sight. We can do it patiently because we still trust in the goodness and the mercy of God. And that leads me to my last practical application, which is this, put on Christ. Put on Christ. I'm glad that the Duns never picked up their life jacket. Weeks ago, way back when we were in the beginning of the book of Romans, when we were talking about how we're condemned in Christ, when we're talking about being in our sin, it's almost like we were, the picture is almost like we're drowning in an ocean. And there's absolutely nothing that we could do to save ourselves. I mean, we might be able to doggy paddle and swim and flop around for a while, but eventually what's going to happen, we're going to drown. But then suddenly, because of what Jesus Christ did on, for us on the cross, the righteousness of God appears. And when you get saved, it's like you're swimming over and you're grabbing a hold of Christ. You're putting on Christ. Christ is your hope. Christ is your foundation. Christ is everything that you need. And what we need to do is we need to completely put on Christ. This is really hard with a handheld microphone. And probably the extra food I've been eating lately. I don't even know if I'm going to try to zip it up today. I want you to see how this plays out. When we're talking about Jesus being the gift that truly changes everything, when we put on Christ, you will never, ever, ever find yourself in a situation in this life where you will be without hope because you will always have Christ. And look at what he did. When he ascended into heaven, his disciples were fearful. And he said, he told them, don't fear. When I'm gone, I'm going to send the comforter. I'm going to send my spirit unto you. And look how this passage ends this morning. Look at verse 26. Likewise, the spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. 
And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. You want to talk about how awesome and amazing our God is? I'm thankful that he doesn't skip over and browse over suffering. I'm thankful that our God tells us the truth. He tells us exactly what it's going to be and what, it's going to, and what we're going to face in this life. If you want to be like Christ, if you want to enjoy all the full benefits in this life, then get ready to suffer with him and get ready to go through the painful realities of life. And when you are at your lowest and when you are at your most broken in life, when you go to God and the groanings in your heart are so deep that you don't even know what to say, you don't even know what to pray, you don't even know what to do at that moment, you know the best thing you can do is put on Christ, throw yourself to him because in those moments, he who searcheth the hearts, that's God. He doesn't need to hear your words. He, needs, he doesn't need to hear your words to hear you. He knows you. He searches your heart. He sent the Holy Spirit of God to do that. And as you throw yourself on Christ and as you rely on him and as you just go to God and you don't even know what to say or do or breathe or what the, the next step to take, you know what the Holy Spirit does? He offers up intercessions with groaning He's got compassion for us and our situations and he's able to take those thoughts and those feelings and he's able to turn them into prayers that are according to the will of God. And you know when you put on Christ and you throw yourself on him and you say, God, I'm drowning. I don't know what to do. I don't even know what to say. I don't even know what to ask for. This feels like it's too much. The weight of it all is just, it's, it's, I can't take it any longer. I need you. You know what you do? You live. You live. And you move on, and God helps you. You know what that looks like? Our church saw a picture of what that looks like back in March. When Jaden got hit by a car and his life was taken from him. You know what his parents did? They threw themselves to Christ. They didn't know what to pray. They didn't know what to say. They just knew they needed a strength that they weren't going to be able to find in anyone or in anything. And they threw themselves on Christ. And you know what happened? As a result of that, his dad was able to get up here on this stage in front of everybody and preach his son's funeral. And he was able to offer forgiveness to the man that hit and took his son's life. And he was able to proclaim the goodness of God at the most heart-wrenching, horrendous thing that a parent could ever experience and ever go through. Do you understand? That's what Christmas is all about. Without Jesus, we would be of all men most miserable. There would be no hope. There would be no glory. Christmas isn't frivolous. It's not just about the lights, and it's not just about the presents and the gifts and the traditions and all the wonderful things that you're going to do and experience. I promise you this, some Christmases will work out great, and some Christmases won't, and they'll leave you broken. But that's not what it's about. It's about a God who knows the reality of what we go through. And in our brokenness and in our most desperate moments, when we don't even know what to say, we throw ourselves into his arms and the spirit of God steps in and intercedes and we live. And we live with hope. And even though we don't know how we're going to get through another day, we get through another day because the spirit of God lives inside of us and he enables us. And we never let go of that hope. We keep holding on to hope. For by hope we are saved. Hope in the glory that is coming. Hope in the glory that Jesus gave his life for to give to us. 